How's it going everybody? Raising Hell here and today we're going to be taking a look at Regalia of Men and Monarchs. So you might be a little bit surprised that I'd be playing any sort of game that looks like this and I really didn't seek it out basically. The developers sort of just sent me a key to it and they're quite professional about the whole thing. Usually when it comes to getting like press releases of games for coverage, uh, usually you gotta beat the bushes a little bit when you're as small as I am, but in this case the, the developer Pixelated Milk was quite forthcoming in just emailing me and giving me a key for it. So figured I'd play it, see what it was about, see if it would be of interest to the people who watch my channel basically. And I think it is overall. Uh, like I'm initially a little bit uh, turned away by the art style because it's not an art style that I generally find appealing, but you know, I'm more than willing to like give it the benefit of the doubt basically. So currently I am in chapter one. We're gonna load up an existing game that I've started playing. Uh, we're gonna just gonna load it up and then I'm going to be talking a little bit about the game. Okay. Uh, so what the idea behind Regalia is, is it's primarily an, a story-driven RPG. So uh, you have an entire party here of members. You can talk to some of them. Uh, it's, it's what you would expect from an RPG in that sort of sense, where there is... There is a great deal of lore uh, behind the story, a good deal of it is actually fully voice acted, uh, but then there is plenty of it that you simply have to read, uh, such as this interaction here. So there is a lot that you can discover basically by reading through this stuff. There are multiple choice, so you can actually impact the story. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how much of an impact this has, but uh, there is a certain amount of multiple choice here. Uh, so that pretty much takes care of that event. Now this is a location that I can save at. And there aren't a whole lot of locations you can save at on this campaign. So we have some events here in the right side of the screen. Uh, new characters have arrived. We have a new codex entry. My quests have been updated and my party has leveled up. So as you can see, here is my party. These are basically the characters that you use to fight the battles. So there's a fair amount of tactics in this game, so it's not yeah, I suppose most RPGs do have a fair amount of tactics in it. Uh, so I think in that sense, it might appeal to those of you who enjoy strategy, not just the RPG elements of it. Uh, the, how would I put it? There, there was a fair amount of complexity in the battles themselves, in the tactics battles themselves. As you can see here, uh, the characters will have various amounts of resistance to different damage types. So we have damage types like fire resistance, ice and thunder, and of course, physical uh, resistance and then the same applies to the, the damage that they would be doing and then you have uh, like just your your average stats basically so we have like accuracy of this character dodge initiative movement uh, pretty much self-explanatory by and large and we have got perks over here uh, special items apparently we have unlocked another slot so we have one free slot remaining we can slot in some perk here that requires one uh, total slot, I guess. So quick thinking would give us plus four initiative. We could do brawler plus 3% damage. By and large, I found this character is more useful uh, for the more the more uh, commanding aspects of the game. Better at being a commander than a damage dealer, basically. Yeah, so this is my leader. He's the king, basically. Quite a young king, still Still getting his feet wet, I suppose you could say. And then these are a whole, there's a whole cast of rather wacky characters with their own backstories that have become a part of this party. Uh, but overall, we've pretty much seen everything that has to do with the party itself. Let's continue on our journey. So we can click go back to dungeon. We'll leave this camp and we're going to be loading up uh, the dungeon screen. So this is basically. You have these nodes that you jump to. Uh, in our case, we cleared this one. There is a there's a story over here on that node, or we can do a battle up here. Usually, the stories are relatively short, so we're going to do one of those first. It doesn't cost anything to travel between these nodes, uh, but at the end, once you complete the dungeon, they'll deduct a certain number of day days depending upon 
Um, the, the amount of days deducted depend upon the type of dungeon you go into and it, it will stay beforehand. Uh, the days are important because you only have a limited number of them, uh, but we'll go into that in a little bit more depth later on. So here we have one of our events, the Tree of Wishes. You encounter a lone gnarled tree long since whitened by time. Its dead ash and branches pine for the skies in an embracing gesture, retaining an odd sense of slumbering vitality. Needless to say, it visibly stands out from the surrounding flora. So now we have the option to examine the tree or just go on now. What fun would it be to ignore the tree? Let's examine it. The trunk itself appears old but in good condition. Strangely unblemished by the trappings of age, aside from many obviously man-made knife scars, hundreds of tiny copper amulets hang from the tree's twisting branches, likely a remnant of some obscure custom or ritual. You recall hearing stories about similar good luck practices among local children, couples you cannot recall. So we have a few options here. Let's uh, let's do the charitable thing and pluck one. Nah, hmm. all of these seem a little bit rough to the tree, but let's do the least damaging one. Maybe what, taking an amulet won't kill us. These small corded amulets are almost coin-like in size and style. As far as you can tell, they are all exactly the same. Round, rough to the touch, and minted with some simplistic symbols. There is an inscription around the trim. Upon the moon so blue, wish and it'll come true. We shall take it. Pocket the amulet and continue on your journey. So nothing all that significant happened here, but apparently we did get a lucky charm and also gain some experience from doing so. So let's continue on our quest through this, uh, this dungeon. And we have another node to clear. This is a battle node. So basically when you're in a dungeon, there will be three types of nodes. There was the camp node. We already cleared that. Uh, there are the multiple choice nodes. They are uh, represented by an exclamation point. And then there are, of, there are of course battle nodes, in which case you will always be guaranteed a battle. So let's finally get into some, um, some tactics action basically here. We're going to be going to be showing you how the battling in this uh, game works. So in this one, the objective is to simply defeat all the enemies. From time to time, the objectives will vary. Sometimes you'll simply have to hold out against a certain number of waves. But let's get started. So if you're familiar with Heroes of Might and Magic, uh, you might find this a little bit similar. We have basic grid uh, that we, we place our characters on. So I probably want my hero uh, you know, there are obstacles around the map which will create choke points and whatnot. So you have to you have to make some good decisions as to where the ideal location placement would be for these characters. Uh, most of the characters I have take up one space, one square, but then we also have characters that take up multiple squares. So this guy is pretty large, takes up four squares. Uh, we can only deploy four combatants. We have a party of five here, so somebody is going to have to be left left out. At the moment, I'm finding that uh, Signy, what's her name? I don't know exactly what her name is. But anyway, in, gen in general, she is difficult to use because she mostly deals with collateral damage. Like that's when she does, she, that's when she's in her element is when she's actually able to damage multiple enemies at the same time. And there, there isn't a whole lot of flexibility. It's close range damage to multiple enemies, which can only always be a little bit tricky. So let's finish deployment and we can actually get cracking. So up here in the top right corner, you can increase the speed of battles. Make sure that the animations don't drag on too long if all you care about is the, the actual tactics behind it. Uh, now all these characters, as you might have noticed here, have quite interesting and varied abilities. So you're going to be spending a fair amount of time learning each of their abilities and what works best for your playstyle. In my case, uh, in general, I've been, I've been giving, giving my uh, other party members some buffs here, stuff like command. Probably not the most optimal choice. You know, I have, I've been playing the game for about six hours, but uh, there's there's no way to tell if I'm actually playing it optimally, basically. Okay, so now it's her turn. 
Alice, I believe. Uh, she's a mage. So once again, we have all new kinds of various abilities, I guess you could call them. Uh, so uh, how the how the battle system works in this game is you can move and perform an action. You can perform an action and then move or any combination in between. So you're not limited to moving and then performing an action. And then that's the end of this character's turn, providing they have movement points left, they'll be able to move back. Uh, so what, what do we have here that would be kind of interesting to use? Uh, she's a mage, so she deals primarily with fire. Uh, this is a blazing barrier. This is an inferno. Uh, yeah, okay, so this thing is a little bit a little bit tricky to use. And it also requires a line of sight. So you might have noticed when I was trying to place it down there, I couldn't because there are obstacles in the way. So things that will become obstacles to your line of sight are enemies, uh, landmarks, basically like these wheat sheaves on the map, and then also allies. Allies can break your line of sight too. So that's always tricky to deal with. Um, anything else interesting here? Blazing Barrier would set up, so in other words, if we have a Blazing Barrier like this, you can rotate it by pressing Tab. So if we didn't want it to look like that, we could uh, could rotate it. Uh, but I think a Blazing Barrier would work quite excellently in this situation. It will be dealing damage to any enemies that cross through it, and of course if I cross through it, it would deal damage as well. So we put, put that barrier up, and now as you can see, uh, I still have movement points left, so I'm just going to retreat here a little bit, I think, and then we'll end that activation. Uh, here we have our main damage dealer. Well, he was up until I got the the dude in the suit of armor, uh, but he's still pretty fairly useful. I don't probably want to charge at these wolves or anything because that would cause them to, or that would cause my hero to run, not my hero, my party member to run through that fire. And firewall, it says, deals damage to any combatant passing through. And this is something I've experienced, unfortunately, multiple times, is where my party is actually, de uh, my party deals damage to other members, basically. Uh, that's never something you, that you want to have happen. Uh, so instead, let's just do like a boisterous challenge. This will apply some negative debuffs to that character. And you can always check to see what a character has going on, be it a friendly or an enemy, by double clicking on them on the map. So as you can see, all the stats are here. Uh, this, this wolf, that's uh, a varg, I guess, in particular is probably the most susceptible to physical damage. It looks like they have the least amount of resistance in that. By and large, I haven't seen any enemies yet that have a disproportionate amount of resistance in any one category. So in other words, I haven't seen it where like, one enemy has 100% ice resistance and therefore that pretty much any attack by a hero of yours that dealt a lot of ice damage would be negligible. Uh, I haven't seen that yet. It probably exists later on in the game. I've really only started scratching the surface here because there was a fair amount to it. Uh, but then you can see there are tons of perks here. Uh, these are the skills that the wolf has at its disposal. So in other words, when it attacks my party members, uh, two attacks there. You got to you got to keep an eye on that to make sure you can counter it sufficiently. And then it also has a whole bunch of effects uh, applied to it. So I taunted it, and now it's supposedly forced to attack the inflictor. So that would be that character, this Griffith dude that I recently activated. Uh, then blinded. So in other words, decreases the chance to hit with all skills by 25%. So if you look at attributes, uh, the, the, you would think your accuracy would go down, but it doesn't seem to. So I'm not exactly sure how that skill works. Uh, because most of the other ones, like you can see here, the character has been buffed uh, due to I think wolf pack that the other wolf is applied or something uh, and you can see it's, it's showing up as a, a buff but for some reason like the blinded doesn't show up maybe it'll show up next turn and then weapon damage increased by 25 percent yeah so you get a good overview of what all the characters have there they're, it's fairly complex like i said um and i think that's one of the really nice aspects of it being uh uh, like a turn-based tactics strategy game. So if you, if, like, I enjoy Heroes of Might and Magic, and the battles here are somewhat similar, uh, albeit with uh, individual character members rather than entire armies of troops represented in a single tile by like a number, like 100 centaurs are in this tile. You know, instead you just have your one character. But you know, the gameplay is largely the same. 
Okay, well, he did his job, so let's end the activation. And now we have this guy. So he has some fun abilities. So in this case, he has like Holy Diver. He can teleport to an empty space and deal 50% base damage to surrounding enemies. I'm not exactly sure we have anything around here that's really capable of doing it. I think pretty much all the enemies are out of range for that one. Uh, Holy Nova can apply some shields to my uh, guys. And then here's a last night. So this is a, another barrier type thing that you can put up. Uh, this one is shields instead of flames. So in other words, we can, we can start walling ourselves in here rather nicely. I'm not exactly sure where where I would want to put that. As you can see right now, uh, Griff, Griffith is blocking my line of sight here, so I wouldn't be able to put a, a line of shields down in this location unless I decided to move first, and I don't think it can move there. So let's instead put down our last line of defense shields, maybe right about here. Let's see if we can do that. So there we got some shields sort of digging in here so that either they'll probably well or they can just go around that hall <laughs> something to keep in mind yeah so they seem like these phoenix birds they can attack and then run hit and run quite nicely uh, so that is a lot of what the combat is like i'm not exactly sure there's a whole lot of merit in going into it deeper because basically uh, once you understand like the abilities the characters use, it's simply figuring out the best time and place to use them all. So let's focus on some more interesting aspects to it. So bottom right corner here, here you see the regular unit cycling. Uh, so you, you can tell which order the units will activate in. And if you don't want your unit to be used right now, you can always wait and then it'll be placed later in the queue. So in other words, if we click wait on my hero there, uh, that wolf, decided to run in there and take some damage the the firewall did do a fair amount of damage to it so you know it's doing its job basically and in the upper left corner we have authority points and authority points is basically how you use these characters ultimate so if you think a little bit like dota or league of legends where they the characters have ultimates i think i think they do in league of legends i i can i'm sure of that for dota but i've never played lol so to my understanding, it was similar to Dota, and Dota has ultimates. And anyway, uh, so if these characters all have basically ultimate abilities, and they require authority points. So it's always good to keep those in check. Uh, in the upper right corner, this is, might be interesting, potentially a, a little bit controversial. We can actually just skip this battle if we want to, and we'll still receive all of the rewards. So now this is like an interesting decision uh, that the developers made. I'm not exactly sure it should have been in it by default. I think it is a great idea because some people just play the game for the story alone, which is perfectly A-OK. -okay. Uh, uh, but I think it would be nice where you could just go into the menu and then check that option to skip rather than just giving it here. But, you know, to each their own. Uh, we can also forfeit the battle. So in other words, we can leave it and then come back to it later. Now, I wanted to show a little bit more about the town aspect of this. So we're going to try to exit this dungeon here. So just keep in mind that abandoning a dungeon run in progress comes with some drawbacks. If you do, the calendar will still advance by the full number of days, but don't cry just yet. Here's a tip. Try to clear as many nodes as you can in one go. Yeah, we're going to pack up and do this because since the game does, you know, the game does auto save, but at the same time, uh, you can do manual saves. So we can always reload this part later. And then uh, actually I, I could, well, I could, me, me, yeah, I could go ahead and reload that, let that save that game save later. So that way I can play it through again properly. Since I'm not focusing on the actual story itself in this first impressions, I'd rather describe uh, the game mechanics more so than the actual story. I'm just skipping through all of that. Uh, so here we have the main campaign map, I guess you could call it. We can scroll up and down. It's a fairly big campaign map. These are all the dungeons. Uh, so far I've cleared out two, I think. So this one and this one, I believe. Well, maybe three, two or three, but I cleared out two. They've been largely like the dungeon that you saw before. Traveling from dungeon to dungeon takes time. This is our capital, I believe. This is where, I, if this is the capital, this is where I want to go because uh, this is basically where the rest of the game takes place. So in the capital, we have our various buildings. Uh, we can upgrade them. 
So we have like a merchant house, uh, an inn, and you can just travel to them. And this is basically how the story progresses is by simply traveling to them. This traveling inside the town doesn't actually consume any days off your calendar. So if you were concerned about that, nope, not a problem. Uh, and then they're just dialogues that you have of a lot of these characters. If you are familiar with RPGs, uh, you're probably, it's probably pretty standard fare overall. If you like reading through dialogue, if you like stories, if you like lore, uh, this game has plenty of that. So like if we take a look over here at the game menu, we've seen this place before. Let's cover some of the other, the other tabs aside from our our characters tab. So like, we have an inventory tab. I hear a, a whole bunch of fun stuff that apparently I acquired. I probably need to equip some of it to my, my new characters. We, then we also have like components and glimmer. These are these are used to build buildings. There are quests, no active quests, but we do have completed adventures. Yeah, I'm not. Oh, here we go. Kingdom quests. Here are the quests that I'm usually doing. So as you can see, we have quite a few areas to work on. The engineering, construction. Uh, so basically, they focus on many different aspects of rebuilding a kingdom, since that, that is our primary objective. Uh, the story is based around uh, a young and promising prince become king, I suppose, who takes over a, an inherited estate that's been run down and is on the brink of being repossessed by a, a merchant or some evil, evil looking dude. Uh, personal bonds, it, these are basically how well the other characters in the world like you. So in addition to our party members, you'll probably be familiar with this guy, party a party member. Uh, but in addition to those characters, we also have the characters from around our village. So right here we have a merchant. Um, here we have like the resident bum, I guess. And what, what else? I recently got Gunther. I think he's going to be a blacksmith as soon as I build his building. So it takes care of personal bonds. Basically how you increase the personal bonds between the characters and your uh, the main character by talking to them. I don't think the sort of dialogues that you choose have much bearing on how well or how quickly you bond with them, but it's certainly possible. So if you don't really like doing that over and over again, it could be an issue for you. Uh, here we have our town where we upgrade various buildings or build various buildings. Since we recently got Gunther, but I haven't built a smithy yet. Let's take a look at that, the details. I have all the components I need. So as soon as we exit the, this screen, we're going to be going over and actually building it, the smithy that is. And then here we have other factions in the world. Now I haven't had any de real dealings with them yet. Of course, we have one of the party members who rep he has a style very similar to these guys over here. I'm not exactly sure what they're called, but apparently there are various different factions in the world and uh, you can be on their good side or their bad side, or you can try to play the field and make all sides happy. But if you are at all experienced with Civilization 4, you probably realize that that is ultimately a, a futile endeavor because you just end up making everybody hate you for being a backstabber and sort of a sneak. Yeah, but so apparently befriending these various factions gives you various perks. So it's really, uh, it's something to keep in mind when thinking strategically exactly which side you go with, depending upon which perks appeal to you and your style of play. And then of course we have the ever popular codex. This is basically uh, a storage of the lore in the game. So if you're interested in reading more, you can always look at the backstories here. Unfortunately, it doesn't contain previous conversations that you've had with characters. I think it's, it's a little bit of a, a downside because sometimes, sometimes you just skip through a lot of it or you forget something. Like let's say you've been playing the game and then you, le you lay off on it for a week or so. You might forget some of the things that happened uh, in the recent past and it would be a little bit nice to be, have a have the opportunity to refresh yourself on that if you so desire. Now I'm not somebody who is ever big on story. Uh, to me the the gameplay itself has always took first place in any game that I've played but I know a lot of people actually do care about the story of the game and by and large there seems to be a fairly 
of a fairly long and entailed story to uh, regalia. So that's that's really nice. If that's the, si the sort of thing that appeals to you, I think the game has you covered. Uh, so let's see. Let's see if we can leave. Go back to the main castle menu. And we're going to jump into our actual castle itself. This is where our uh, royalty live. So basically, if we talk about who exists in this world, the story is surrounded by me, the main character. It's always the same person. Uh, and then you have his bodyguard, maybe. I forget exactly what his position was. And then he has two sisters who apparently are also royalty, but they didn't inherit the castle or anything. Uh, so in addition to Venture Forth, which is basically how you get into the adventure map that we for the dungeoneering that we were looking at before, here we have town. Can't say that word, apparently. Here we have town construction. And this, even though this screen looks familiar, this is how we build new buildings and upgrade existing ones. So you can see uh, Pathfinder Study, a whole bunch of stuff that we can't unlock yet. That one and that one. Uh, but we can build the smithy now. So let's go ahead. We got enough ingredients, just barely, I think. 11 out of 13 are required. And we're going to get Gunther, his blacksmith, built. Uh, that took a couple of days. So it's always something to keep in mind when you have a deadline. And now we can go back to the castle. And once we have Gunther's Smith up and built, pretty much as of now, uh, that means that we can actually talk to him and form bonds with him. So previous to having his building built, we were unable to go ahead and talk to him, but now we certainly could. And it looks like my bodyguard is also hanging out over there. So if we look at the calendar here, we can see who has the day off and where they're currently located. So today is Trolls Day. Basically, we have the standard week, but they renamed all of the various days into something a little bit more thematic. So let's take a look at Gunther. He is currently around and he's in the smithy. So we should be certainly capable of running over there and speaking to him. Yeah, there we go. So let's initiate this so here we go we have the opportunity to spend the day with him and then the game just loads up and we've basically okay this uh, from time to time this will vary so he's going to be talking to me a little bit about his his blacksmith shop uh, I was wondering if it's spectacular and since I'm the one who built it and paid for it I think it is spectacular indeed uh, be, 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 be. Make sure to give it your best. Okay, so now that we've covered all that, our personal bond with him should have increased, and then this can potentially unlock cool new perks that we can use. So, as you can see, alert right here. One of your personal bonds has grown stronger. Let's take a look at that. Um... Okay, we have, we, he's become an acquaintance by now. So as you can see, the, at least the very first rank, it happens relatively quickly uh, as you go up. So in other words, I mean, that's the nice thing, right? That you don't have to just really, really grind at it. Like if you had to do this five times in a row just to get to the first level, I think that would be a bit excessive. But, you know, it unlocked right away. So there's a, there's a real feeling of progression. Unfortunately, the first level doesn't unlock any perks in particular, but we can now unlock, well, we have unlocked the crafting of regular weapons. So that's something I haven't done before. Uh, and I, I don't think I'm going to try it here and now because I'm going to try to wrap this up a little bit. By and large, I have covered pretty much everything the game is about. I guess I, I could talk a little bit about the calendar, but I have completed those objectives at the moment. So if we went back over here into the quests, uh, the chapter one objectives were to have four plus kingdom quests completed. I have five days left, so I'm doing very well. And then we can just fa focus on completing more of all of these quests in between the various lore drops that we get from time to time and the natural progression of the story. So by and large, I think that pretty much covers what regalia of men and monarchs is as a game, what it's about, kind of how it plays, what, can ex what you can expect from it when playing. Like I said, 
So far, I've only invested about six hours into it. And as with most RPGs, uh, it has a lot more to give. Basically, I'm only on chapter one. But, you know, take that for what it's worth. As I mentioned before, I was given a key for this game. So I don't know if that's required for FTC compliance, but that is the fact that I didn't buy the key myself. So if you think that has colored my opinion of it unduly, fair enough. Uh, but otherwise, feel free to check it out if it's up your alley. It's a fairly, fairly in-depth and well-polished game in my opinion. So yeah, thanks for watching as always, and I hope to see you next time.